yeah. What's good, world? Illogic, aka C Reality. Yeah, let's get in this newness. Yo, let me break down the science. We were born divine, no need for compliance. Okay, so um, my name is Hannah Dobbs, and uh, as I said, I, I, I literally just touched this book with a 1st time two days ago, so I don't think anyone's even read it yet, so um, this is the second presentation I've done, I was in Buffalo last night, and, um, and we had a really good time here, so I'm, anyway, I'm really excited to be here and talking to all of you, and especially um, uh, doing this uh, in conjunction with the Housing Justice Summit from earlier today, um, I know there's a lot of people in the room who are really active and stuff like this. So it's really cool, and um, thank you to, to John and Ted for setting up the event and Flying Squirrel for hosting. Um, it's really amazing. Um, so I guess I put I a presentation which I created in PowerPoint, which is a proprietary software, and um, does not display properly in OpenOffice, so uh, we're, we're actually missing some of the text there, and a lot of the slides are kind of funky. Like your name. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but you're all creative people, I'm sure you can imagine, like, how to fill in the blanks. Um, I was thinking about maybe only doing about half the presentation anyway, because, or at least half the PowerPoint, um, because the PowerPoint mostly focuses on the conditions of the house, of housing as a market and how that led to um, the current situation of a surplus in vacancies across the country and then also the um, the conditions that pressure people to uh, to squat and and, um, and uh, participate in like eviction defense and, and all these things that we're here to talk about. Um, but that's really sort of market centric and just kind of explaining like the roots of all of that, which um, which I do want to go into, but I don't want to focus too much on these a lot of these things that we were talking about earlier today uh, because I know a lot of you are here and I don't want to be redundant. Uh, that said, I'd love to hear from you guys about what you want to talk about because there are a lot of different threads in this book um, as far as uh, you know different different ideas that sort of get run with um, because squatting and property resistance uh, is a really kind of multifaceted issue and there are lots of discussions to be had. So. Um, would any of you want to shout out like some things that maybe you're hoping to get out of tonight? How to deal with the police. How to deal with the police. <laughs> How to send a banker to the prison. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Please don't have any legal alternatives. Legal alternatives? So like legal um, like ownership structures that are, yeah. or is that, is that how yeah, you mean? It seems like um, going back maybe a couple of decades, a lot of my friends were into these high homes and is that still done? You know, you fix up an old house and you get it at practically nothing because you're fixing it up yourself rather than it just going back and Oh, okay, okay. So maybe like um, like the um, short-lived federal program on urban homesteading, like um, stuff like that? Unless that's too off topic. <laughs> um, well, we'll see, we'll see what we have time to go into. Okay, so we have got police. How do you with police? Getting banks in trouble, alternative uh, ways of getting to become a homeowner? Is that, is that what you mean? Yeah, legal alternative. Okay. Anything else? I guess I would like to, to, to start, if you would be willing, with kind of like how this came about, like what the what even the title means, and like, this, like a little synthesis or some kind of like to about the book, like what some of the things that are in here. Sure. Kind of summary. But. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll start by saying that um, so nine tenths of the law is from. Maybe you've heard it, it's this kind of um, saying that this, um, possession is nine tenths of the law. Which I feel like more recently has sort of been distorted a lot of times to um, like like police will use it because they think it means like, well, you are in possession of these drugs, so you are going to jail because possession is nine tenths of the law, but that's kind of backwards, that's kind of like not really what it means. It's more of like in an ownership dispute, how do you prove who is the owner of something? And the easiest way to prove it, or at least nine-tenths of the way to proving that you own something, is who is actually in possession of that thing. Um, so historically, that's, that's sort of been 
uh, one of the gauges for uh, for testing ownership. So nine tenths of the law, as far as like if you're occupying a building, well then that should be considered nine tenths your building. Um, did that kind of yeah, and just like the coming about of like the book and the right, right, right. so then just to contextualize it before we get all these specifics that I know people really want to like Sure. Well, um, so I started out actually um, squatting myself in 2005 and 2006 um, in California in the East Bay. I was living in Emeryville. And actually, uh, there are some slides here about my own personal backstory. I hope that if I am here, I'm not going to be too much in your way. Okay. So, um, blah, blah, blah. All right. This is... <laughs> this was the building that I lived in for close to two years. Uh, this is actually the building just before it got demolished, so it didn't really look like this most of the time that I lived there. Um, they had already started tearing down the building next to it. Uh, but, but we had this really unique situation with the owner um, who we met after we started squatting there, and he was actually kind of happy to have us there because we were an alternative to um, what he called the riffraff, and some other types that, that could be occupying the space. Um, and the reason he didn't care was because the building was embroiled in a, uh, an eminent domain case. Uh, is, is everybody here familiar with eminent domain? Does, any, does anybody not know what eminent domain is? I don't even know what, <laughs> what that means. So eminent domain is when a municipality can compel a private property owner to sell their property to them. Um, for, for the use of the public good. So if this building was in the way of, uh, you know, they were planning to have a highway go through because it's a public road and, um, and that was gonna be for the public good, then they could say, okay, well, you have to sell your building to us, but we will give you just compensation for it. So a lot of times um, these cases will spend years sometimes in court trying to figure out what just compensation really means. In the case of this building, um, they, the building itself was worth $5 million. However, there had been um, ground contamination from the, built, from the uh, company that was there a couple decades earlier, Standard Oil. Um, so in order to, <laughs> the cost of the bioremediation to actually make the land uh, non-toxic would have been $7 million. <laughs> So this is tied up in court because they can't figure out, they say, oh, well, we want to give you $5 million for this, but then it's an extra $2 million to do the cleanup. So anyway, years in court, and during that time, the building had to stay empty, um, legally speaking, technically speaking, it had to be empty. Um, but he wanted us in there because there was uh, less chance that the building would burn down in the meantime. There was less chance that there would be um, you know, drug deals, things like that. So, um, so that's kind of a, an unusual scenario, but that's, that's where we lived. Um, it was an old boat, motor, and turbine sales office with a warehouse next to it where they used to keep those things. Um, so we, we turned a lot of the old offices into our bedrooms, kind of decorated the place with things that we found in the building, um, like this big plastic marling hanging from the ceiling. <laughs> Um, a lot of the furniture we either found in the building or nearby. Uh, this is the problem with this, uh, <laughs> with this um, program that we're using is some things that are upside down, that's me. Um, but of course not all squatting situations are quite as um, romantic and idealistic as, as our find that place? Um, it was just on the train tracks. Uh, I mean, it was very visible. Um, it was right across the street from, or right across the tracks from the Amtrak <coughs> station, actually. And the neighborhood that we were in used to be uh, heavily industrialized. It was like a very industrial place uh, historically, but in the past, like um, 15 or 20 years, it had been turned more into a commercial district. So gradually, all of the industrial aspects of the neighborhood were either getting demolished or transformed, and it was basically becoming a giant mall. Um, so they had these like, outdoor malls, it was very upscale. Um, there were 
they would put up signs like when they were doing construction, they'd have signs up that said "fashionable hard hats required." I mean, it was just like <laughs> it was yeah, it was almost like a like a joke. But um, this is the last industrial building standing. So they actually wanted to tear it down and put a Nordstrom's up, which I don't see how that's considered public good, but um, I guess I'm not working for the city. So, uh, sorry, did that answer, did that yeah. answer your question? Um, oh, right, so I think a lot of what we're talking about is foreclosures, or as this slide says, just foreclosures. <laughs> 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 um, so I don't want to spend too much time on this because I feel like uh, a lot of the day today was spent talking about foreclosures and what you know what happened and what it means. Uh, but you know, as I'm sure you recall, end of 2007, 2008, foreclosure crisis um, left a lot of uh, homes vacant. And uh, of course, this slide is supposed to say what percentage of housing in the U.S. is vacant. So that's my question to you: what what percentage would you estimate? right now in the across the US livable units we're going to talk about livable units and as far as that's percentage? occupied or unoccupied unoccupied vacancies i say 28 28 very good 30 30 anybody else 26.5 <laughs> <laughs> okay well um I hate to disappoint you with, with low numbers, but it's actually, it's, so it's, this is silly. Um, so 14%, right? Uh, which as far as, I mean, we're talking about livable units, like units that you could, someone could actually just move into today. Uh, which makes sense because, you know, with foreclosures, those were houses that were lived in there, like up to code for the most part. Um, that's not taking into account more, di Mm, buildings more on the derelict side um, that could stand to be fixed up. So with those numbers in mind, I don't know, maybe we would be closer to 30, maybe we'd be at something else, but I'm not sure. Um, so interestingly, that number, 14%, that's where we're at now, in 2012. It was the same number in 2008, just after the foreclosure crisis started. So basically, uh, just about five years has passed, nothing's changed. So if we're gonna talk about, um, <clears throat> if we're gonna talk about like, for, for shits and giggles, we'll talk about homelessness numbers also, which according to HUD, um, which is the, uh, is everyone familiar with HUD? Yes, I am. Yeah, okay, so Housing Urban Development is the branch of the US government that deals with housing um, according to HUD statistics, 0.02% of the population is homeless, like actually homeless. Um, so that means like, you know, on the street or in a shelter. Um, they expand that number a little bit more liberally to, if we want to talk about underhoused. So uh, that includes people who are actually homeless, but also sort of chronically homeless, in and out of shelters, staying with family members, generally living in unstable housing. Um, and that number is about 5.05% of the population. So if we compare that to the 14% of livable units that are vacant, I mean, there's a, there's a glaring discrepancy there. Um, so that's like saying, all right, imagine that all of Rochester has just 100 houses in it. A very small town, 100 houses. So if we translate that statistic over, that would mean that 14 of your houses are empty. It also means that five of your city's residents don't have places to live. Now, of course, I'm going to ask you a really stupid question, but how do we rectify this? <laughs> Take over the houses. Both those houses. <laughs> you have two houses each. Well, thanks. Bombs. Put the homeless people in jail. <laughs> Yeah. Give them tickets or something. <laughs> um, so when you put it in those terms, it sounds really obvious, right? But you don't see that actually happening. And the reason is because of police 
and judicial enforcement. It's an enforcement issue. Um, if, so if you were to ask me, and people throw around uh, terms like the housing crisis, there is no housing crisis. Housing crisis implies that there's a shortage of housing. There's no shortage of housing. We can talk about foreclosure crisis, or we can talk about a housing crisis that was manufactured, and it was manufactured by police and judicial enforcement. Mm. Um, so, I mean, this is a familiar sight to people living in the Rust Belt. Um, this is obviously what a house starts out looking something like uh, when it's first abandoned. Mm. Generally, still in good shape, still in good condition, um, fairly movable. Just got some boards over the Where is that? in George. This is actually in Detroit. Um, but for the sake of for the sake of an example, like it starts out being pretty okay. But the, the problem is when houses are abandoned, they deteriorate. They are not. They are no longer maintained. They fall apart. They lose not only market value but use value, um, and become harder to. Uh, to remedy in the future because enough time goes by and something that looks like this might eventually start to look something more like this. Oh, oh my god. And then after enough time goes by, something more like this. And just sort of gets swallowed back up into the yeah. earth and you lose that resource. Um, the, so these pictures were from Detroit, which has a 26.5% residential vacancy rate. 25%. Whoa. Yeah, so it's about a quarter of quarter of the residential properties in the city are something like this. Um, so why does this happen? This happens because of uh, planned obsolescence. I mean, this is, this is the cycle that we're in where we, we build and then abandon, build and then abandon. So um, some fun facts to back that up are, uh, it's estimated that by 2025, which really isn't that far from now, more than half of our built environment will not have existed 25 years earlier. Wow. Because they continue building. So this is the part of the foreclosure crisis that we don't talk about. It's like, yes, people are getting kicked out of their houses. Yes, we have homeless people. Yes, we have vacancies. But the thing is that we continue to build, which actually increases the vacancy rate. So by 2025, also, uh, 22 million of those vacancies will be unwanted large lot suburban homes, which also continue to be built despite their tendency for depreciation, rapid depreciation. Yeah. So why can't we just take the, the houses that are empty, and you know the piece of junk, and just take over them? Yeah, that's, that's uh, a great uh, idea. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah. But like I was saying before, it's an enforcement issue, um, which we'll talk more about later. So on the one hand, you have construction, and on the other hand, you have demolition, simultaneously. So for example, Minneapolis, Youngstown, Detroit, Cincinnati, they all allocate at least a third of their so-called neighborhood stabilization funds actually to just tearing down buildings. <clears throat> oh, and then I had a really great chart here. But basically it just sort of illustrated that um, the construction rate and the rate of distressed properties are linked. So regions that have uh, high construction rates also have high distressed property rates. Um, and you can see it the most in, um, in a place like Florida, which, um, you know, despite their 19% distressed property rate, they continue to issue all these construction permits and issue, uh, let's see if I can remember the numbers. Mm, I forget what the number is, but like, but like even more than the year before. So the statistics I have is from 2010, um, they, I don't know, they multiplied the number of permits that they had issued in 2009 by 2010. So, uh, so, so not only do they continue to build, but they continue to build even more. Um, same thing in Detroit. Detroit had this crazy number of, uh, you know, they have, uh, I, I forget what the numbers were, but they had a 69% uh, increase 
in construction permits that were issued in 2010 from 2009. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, I mean, they're close to, to doubling the number of, of construction projects that they had even just the year before, despite the fact that they already have, as I'm sure you're all familiar, like just a, a glut of abandoned properties in the city. Anyways, so that's where I want to end the, the actual PowerPoint because this is obviously um, falling, falling apart. But uh, <laughs> maybe that'll, okay, should I just turn this off? All right. Uh, so to, to sort of back up a little bit more of like what I'm saying about this, I really just want to read a short section to you about um, housing as a market. And we can use that as kind of a launching off point for more discussions about um, kind of like a, uh, a therefore segue. You say, okay, this, therefore, what next? And we'll talk about um, some of those other things that people said they wanted to talk about. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna read to you from um, the beginning of chapter four, which is all about uh, the foreclosure age. So the problem with housing as a market is that markets are rooted in risk, which makes them perpetually unstable. When the necessity of housing transforms into the commodity of housing, it puts everything else about housing at risk as well. Shelter, comfort, home. Housing can exist as a market, however, because of the capital that has gone into the houses themselves. This includes materials like concrete, wire, plumbing, and ducts, but also the dead labor of the construction workers who put those raw materials to use, increasing the value of the structure as a whole. This, plus the interest on whatever loans developers had to take out to complete the project, logically determines the value of the structure. But in addition to the real capital that has gone into such building projects, their market values are influenced by imaginary capital tied to speculation. With the introduction of imaginary capital, housing enters the realm of commodity, and the prices of commodities being speculated on seem to lose any connection to how much work time it takes to make them. Money multiplies and profits seem to come out of thin air. What's worse is that because of the high market value of houses, they often stand in for capital in other markets. Mortgages can act like a note or a piece of currency and can therefore be traded and shuffled around in attempts to make profit. Tied to the note is a promise to pay the declared value of the commodity plus interest. This is incentive for the note holder to take bigger and bigger risks with their notes for bigger and bigger payoff. In the book, All the Devils Are Here, Bethany McLean and Joe Sarah admit that, quote, risk was the bank's obsession. But there is a flip side to market booms. they are corollary busts. Because it's impossible for commodities to continually grow in one direction, markets necessarily operate in cycles. And when, in 2007, the housing bubble burst, splattering a foreclosure crisis across the nation, Economists and investors were quite concerned about the state of the commodity of housing, which continued to be viewed through this artificial lens of imaginary capital and markets. But behind that lens, real people were feeling the real effects of the imaginary market. There was a disturbing shift in perspective for some banks in the business of repossessing homes when their visits to foreclosed properties were met by squatters, <laughs> evidence that something very real beyond the numbers had happened in that market bust. It was a frightening reality for authorities who couldn't possibly monitor the hundreds of thousands of vacant properties across the country. Most of these authorities, bankers, developers, real estate agents, police officers, were unfamiliar with squatters, and their sensational media portrayal boosted fears of illegal occupation Reporters wondered aloud, who are these people so brazenly living in houses they don't own? For months, the media seemed to increasingly uncover indications that such faceless squatters had been inside so many vacant buildings, oftentimes spooked by a bedroll or blankets. Reporters would urge homeowners to carefully secure their properties and to consider a police escort when entering the property in order to prevent squatter attacks. <laughs> Such tips were justified by testimonies like that of broker Patrick Hale. Quote, I was checking on one of my vacant properties and I was on the phone with police because, they were, because there were signs of someone living there. A guy jumped out and told me to get off the phone and before he even tried to grab the phone, he punched me. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
<laughs> Throughout the crisis, horror stories such as this one cascaded into the news. Each story presented property owners, sometimes auction winners, sometimes big banks, as virtuous victims in unpredictable times, always blaming the squatters and never blaming the fits and tantrums of the market. In one tale, Tyler Combs of Portland, Oregon, discovered someone living in the foreclosed house that he had bought with plans to renovate. He was surprised to find new blinds over all the windows and a large freezer chest in the dining room, which he was scared to open. <laughs> <laughs> the media portrayal of squatters in the years following the crash dictated public opinion about who squatters are, what they are after, and why they must be stopped, consistently glossing over the reckless investment practices that pressure them to squat in the first place. So that's kind of like the background on how we got to this place where we're all talking about this. Um, this need to, to fill vacancies. Obviously, vacancies existed before, and obviously, squatting existed before, but um, the foreclosure crisis was kind of a catalyst for movement building, like we were talking about today. Um, so from there, we can sort of uh, open up a little bit more to like talking about, or like, I guess, going into some of the issues that people wanted to talk about specifically. Um, let's see, we talked about police and banks and um, Is that the banker in the freezer? <laughs> <laughs> it was that broker that the guy punched out. <laughs> um, so I guess we could talk about. Hmm. We could talk about the police thing. Or just possession, like like maintaining and and assuring that your possession is. Solidified, as opposed to just being swept out by by the property manager or by the police. Yeah. Okay. Well, so there's a story of Steve DiCaprio. Is anyone familiar with that name? Does that ring any bells? Steve. <laughs> no, no relation. Um, so Steve DiCaprio turned out to kind of um, accidentally become my mentor uh, in 2000. Four, um, he was squatting a house in Berkeley, California, and um, said to me one day, hey, you know, the police keep kind of hassling me about living in this squat, so I was thinking maybe, um, you have a video camera, right? Maybe you could come and videotape my interactions with the police so I can use it in court. And I was like, yeah, sure, I mean, just filming my friends drunk with this anyway, so I mean, I may as well use it for something, <laughs> for something useful. And um, and so I started going down there all the time and filming these, these interactions with the cops, which um, serves two purposes, obviously, like not only documenting what's happening, but also police tend to be on better behavior when they know that they're being watched. So, um, so I did that without really thinking much of it, and then one day he said, uh, sort of offhandedly to me, he's like, you should make a documentary out of this. And I was like, yeah, sure, I don't know how to do that, but I guess I will. <laughs> and, um, and then I ended up making a documentary. But, um, but so Steve DiCaprio is really interesting. He's one of the most tenacious people I've ever met. Um, you, can, uh, you can throw so many hurdles in front of him, and he'll just keep jumping over them. Um, and especially with squatting. So, he was squatting this one house for years, um, and then that eventually uh, failed for a number of reasons. But um, but at the same time, he had been simultaneously uh, maintaining a presence on this other property. So he had the, he had this other squat sort of as a backup <laughs> that whole time. And um, and also, I mean, over the course of the past, I'd say, 12 years that he's been doing this, he's been studying property law. So. Next year, he plans to take the bar um, just from having studied property law on his own um, and hopes to become the country's first squat attorney. <laughs> but, um, but he's a really smart guy. And he ended up in this other house, uh, which he approached, um, he approached this situation, this squatting situation, a little bit differently than the one before, because obviously he had learned some things um, through his interactions with the police and also the t time that he spent in court. 
um, and his interactions with the neighbors. So uh, if, you, if you all are up for another reading, I can read to you a little bit about, about his experience. And so he was squatting with the attempt, um, with the intent to actually gain title to his property, which is like fairly unheard of as a successful thing um, among squatters. Um, so, so a very precocious fellow, and, um, and it ta talks a little bit about his interactions with the police as well. So um, you, you're all up for another reading here? Yeah. All right, so Steve DiCaprio first started thinking about squatting during the late 90s and early 2000s housing boom, because he was in California, you remember? The dot-com boom. Um, when he was evicted from his slummy rental apartment in Oakland because he could not pay the rent. As an alternative to homelessness, he began searching for abandoned properties to squat. He rode his bike all over the East Bay, taking down addresses of potential squats, and eventually found a place that had all the trappings of a successful adverse possession case. Is, it, is everybody here familiar with adverse possession? No. Adverse possession is um, a really old statute that uh, varies state by state. But it essentially means that if you occupy a property, uh, openly and notoriously for a statutory period. So uh, it varies state by state. Uh, New York is 10 years. It was 20, it got reduced, it's 10. Um, California, it's five. Pennsylvania, it's 21. Um, so it's, all, it's kind of all over the place. And, um, and the idea is if you occupy it for that period of time, then you can gain legitimate title uh, to, to the property because it shows that obviously no one else is interested in it. Um, it's a bit of an archaic law, and it's like pretty hard these days to convince judges that <laughs> that um, of your case. But we'll go into that because this is what Steve DiCaprio's attempt was. Uh, he matched the address with an owner's name and address, uh, which oddly was a PO box, and uh, at the tax assessor's office and the records department. He then went to the tax collector's office to check on unpaid taxes and the recorder's office to look up liens. As it turned out, the owner had been dead for 25 years and the property was owned by an estate. DiCaprio calls this scenario ideal. The owner died in the early 80s and the estate was abandoned in 85. The file for the estate was recorded exclusively on microfilm, which was, quote, tucked away in some back area of the courthouse. There were no owners and no heirs. In fact, all the cosmetic renovations done on the house in recent years had been performed by contractors hired by the city because of blight complaints. The executor of the estate paid the property taxes until 2002, which was strange, DiCaprio thought, because that was after he started working on the property. And in 2003, the executor himself passed away, leaving no remaining party to challenge DiCaprio's claim legitimately. DiCaprio approached the situation cautiously and strategically. Though he had first spied the house in late 2000, it was 2002 when the neighborhood was visibly undergoing transition, and he knew that it would be clever to have a presence during this time. In fact, he mobilized his occupation while, uh, while the adjacent house was being remodeled so that the new neighbors would be accustomed to seeing people next door when they moved in. After establishing a constant presence for five years, the statutory period in California. Usually through continued renovations um, and not actually <laughs> sleeping there, um, DiCaprio paid off the back taxes in full. I have fulfilled the adverse possession requirements, he told me in 2009, and therefore, because of that, I own the property and the only step that's left in the, in the whole thing is to have the title recorded. I own the property fully right now. There's no legitimate challenge to be made, but, to get that title recorded and to have it be respected by all, I still have to go through a process where I go to court and say, look, I've paid these taxes, look, I've been on the property, so on and so forth, and tell that to a judge, and then they sign the order. And at that point, I can take out a loan against the property, I can sell the property, neither of which I have any intention to do, but I could do anything that any owner of any other property could do. Right now, I have full rights to do anything I want, but the question is, how does the rest of the world know that I have those rights? DiCaprio figured that because the previous owner had no living relatives and that he had already been uncontested on the property for so many years, that he had fulfilled all the requirements of adverse possession 
Oh, and that he had fulfilled all the requirements of adverse possession, it was extremely unlikely that someone would come forward to stop it. So he filed a quiet title action, which I have in a footnote here, is <laughs> an action for quiet title is when the title holder or landowner brings a squatter or adverse possessor to court, at which time the squatter must prove her right to the property or else forever lose her right to claim it. In this case, DiCaprio acted as the owner, daring any other claimants to come forward at that time or forever lose their ability to do so. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so he decides to move forward with the quiet title action. That said, I don't trust the courts ever to do anything according to the law because the moment you go into court and get branded as a squatter, everything can go haywire, he said. Uh, there's a real classist bias by judges. It's a real class issue. At this point in DiCaprio's claim, however, there was, uh, there was no one who could make a legitimate argument against him, though he recognized that it was possible for someone to make an illegitimate argument. <laughs> DiCaprio's judge, specifically, set the bar very high. Not only did he require DiCaprio to serve the estate, which he did, the attorney is still alive and said he doesn't really care if DiCaprio takes the property, but he also required him to track down all potential heirs through complex and expensive genealogical searches, as well as to serve the estate administrator who is deceased. Strangely, it seemed, the only person alive who still cared about this property was DiCaprio's presiding judge, who realistically held no stake in it whatsoever. <laughs> the estate's attorney, in fact, had been forwarding the estate's mail to DiCaprio, hoping he, would simply, <laughs> hoping he would simply take over responsibility for it. The attorney's biggest complaint in the whole process was that the estate had not yet been transferred to DiCaprio's name. At this point, I realized the judge was completely opposed to me gaining title, DiCaprio said, and I voluntarily dismissed the case. For now, I'm going to wait and refile it at some time in the future after so much time has passed that no reasonable person would oppose it. DiCaprio says that he has a good relationship with the city, despite the judge's hesitation to record title. The relationship is not rooted in what he calls the squatters versus cops dynamic, which he describes as self-destructive. Instead, he used what he calls the straw owner tactic, a common legal concept used to obscure the true owner though DiCaprio takes it to a new level. And this is where the interactions with the police come in. <clears throat> All right, so this is how it works. First, he got a second cell phone. <laughs> he, he hired friends, and they wrote up work, uh, work trade contracts to make it official to start doing some of the serious work needed on the property, including painting, yard work, demolition, and deep cleaning. Um, and inevitably, the police arrived, as expected, and asked, what are you doing? Which is where the straw owner came in. If the owner were on site, then the police could have barraged him with questions such as, how did you get this house? What kind of permits do you have? And so on. But instead, the hired help simply replied, we work for the owner, Steve DiCaprio. Do you want his number? So the police called the second cell phone, and DiCaprio didn't answer it, because he never answers it. <laughs> because only police call that number. <laughs> they declined to leave a message anyway, and that was the end of that. The police have absolutely no business involving themselves in these situations, DiCaprio said but police involve themselves in lots of situations they have no business in <laughs> and cause a lot of trauma in people's lives and I definitely didn't want that dynamic again. After the straw owner incident, there were no further visits from police. Instead, building inspectors and blight officers started popping in at the house in response to neighbors' complaints of the years of neglect, not because they suspected an illegal occupation. According to DiCaprio, you really have to decide when you're occupying a house. Is this gonna be some political thing where we drop the banner and talk to all the neighbors and pass out flyers and say, squatting's great, and we all run around saying, squatter, 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 we love it. <laughs> Are we gonna do that? And then of course get evicted because no one's gonna go along with that? 
Or are we going to focus on the task at hand? And when people ask you, hey, what are you doing? Then you say, I'm fixing this door. It's broken. Uh, and focus on what you're doing with the house and not this philosophical or political element that just alienates you from your neighbors unless you live in Amsterdam or something. Um, so that's like, that's part of Steve DiCaprio's story. He's still there. He's still there. Um, in fact, the, I mean, the city knows that he's there, obviously, because he tried taking it um, to court to get the title recorded. And um, no one's challenging him. No one's giving him a hard time about being there at all. He's integrated into the neighborhood. And um, really, the only, the only thing that's keeping him from being as legitimate as everybody else is this arbitrary um, recorded title, and also um, PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric, won't put him on the grid because it had been so many years since that house had been on the grid, and he doesn't have the kind of documentation that he needs to, to get them to reconnect it. But that's okay because he has a bicycle generator, and so, <laughs> so he lives off of that. Too, too much. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, um, to, to get it back on the grid, all he had to do was hire, hire uh, uh, a, uh, an inspector to do it. You know, that, see, that, that's the other loop in the piece. You know, if he hired his, uh, an inspector, as long as he paid the inspector and the inspector says that it's good to go, he can do it. Well, the other problem is that um, with the condition of the house, I, I don't think he's going to want to let any inspectors in there for a very long time. Uh, <laughs> because I think that would probably be exposing him to too much. I mean, no, house, not the city inspectors, I'm saying. Um, like they got these private in, these private inspectors that you call around and hire. They're basically contractors, but, you know, um, he, 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 he can actually go about it that way, too. I don't know what the law is in California, but I know here it's legal. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what his strategies are as far as that, but, um, but that's, that's as much of his story as, as I know. Um, so I guess I don't, I think it's a little early to go into Q&A probably, but um, maybe, I don't know, do you guys want to hear like one more passage maybe, or do you want to just like talk on yeah. some other, okay. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Okay, gather around, children. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, do you guys want to hear about um, some? Um, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. I like lots of questions. Do you see anything about kind of that? Um, I don't know. What I see is like a cultural like disposition towards building new houses and how squatting might counteract that or I mean do you yeah have, I don't know. um yeah I have some stuff on that I didn't like <coughs> mark off a section for it so that's okay I would do I might have to like look at it really quick and see like yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I said, I'm kind of nervous to read this because it might be like kind of more of like a read to yourself sort of like. Yeah, that's fine. Sort of. <laughs> I don't know how entertaining it would be. Um, although, I mean, I guess one fun, I could read this one fun part about um, sort of like the. So there's this chapter called The Story, this is like toward the end, The Stories of Spaces, uh, Urban Planning and the Wonder of Used Places, and just sort of like the magic and the history that's tied into places that already exist, um, rather than sort of like uh, wiping a clean slate uh, historically by building new structures that don't have a history. Um, I mean, this. so this part isn't really like, uh, chock full of like statistics and facts and stuff, but um, it might be a fun read if you guys are feeling like story time. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Um, a pal and I were recently admiring the river from an abandoned capsized boat 
that had washed ashore many decades ago. I live in Pittsburgh. This boat is in Pittsburgh. Um, this seemingly forgotten vessel is actually, evidently, a popular hangout spot in Pittsburgh. The unfeeling metallic beast is covered in graffiti with messages ranging from up the punks to I had mad sex here. <laughs> So what me worry what me horny? The boat appears to have been anchored to a nearby tree at one time with a thick braided dock line. When I pointed this out to my friend, we then noticed that the rope had been tied there for so long that the tree had actually grown into it and it had now almost completely subsumed it. It was at that moment that I realized that I knew more about the history of both the boat and the tree, and I suppose the dock line, than I knew about, about anything at the active marina a quarter of a mile up the river. I wasn't just seeing the tree and the boat at one point in time, now, I was seeing it over a period of time, and, in, and on that intangible timeline unfolded the histories of the pieces of my present. I suddenly also knew about all the people who had sat on this discarded watercraft before me, or had sex on this one. <laughs> <laughs> you were just sitting? <laughs> <laughs> um, through their written messages scrawled across the boat's patina. In this way, I can say that Pittsburgh is a city with a history. Of course, all cities have histories and all places have histories, but some places only tell their stories in rustles and murmurs. In Rust Belt cities such as Pittsburgh, however, striking messages are left behind in sites of disrepair, such as crooked sidewalks, derelict houses, and even this capsized boat. Once, in Boston, I noticed two city workers jovially repainting by hand the yellow no parking line on a curb. While a city like Boston can evidently afford to hire and pay two people to hand repaint a singular yellow line, <laughs> A city like Pittsburgh is hard-pressed to even pick up its residents' recycling. Because of this stark difference, uh, the stark differences in the strengths of each city's economy, a municipality like Boston, that technically has more history than most other urban areas in the country, can afford to display only a singular moment of its story, that moment being the current one, by paving over all of its sordid past. This, of course, sounds ridiculous because probably the bulk of the city's structures are considered historical, but none of the historical edifices appear aged since they are maintained so meticulously. In Pittsburgh, buildings are dilapidated, roads have potholes, and there is rarely funding for any two people to hand paint lines on the streets the way that Boston does. While the strapped public works department is certainly an inconvenience to many, there is no doubt that its negligence at least allows for the city to express its stories more visually. All of which explains why no one ever moved this capsized riverboat from which my friend and I wondrously contemplated the recent past. I had always thought that people like me, oh, and, I, and then I do this thing with footnotes, people like me, um, people who might live in abandoned buildings, were interested in places like Pittsburgh, places with abandoned buildings, because people like me, people who write books about abandoned buildings, <laughs> are infatuated with the post-industrial landscape motif and because we cannot let go of the idea of a, of a pending apocalypse or because we inexplicably like broken things better than working ones. But as I gazed at the place where the tree had digested that thick old rope, transforming it into one expressive object, I understood that we love those places because they tell us a story. It is for the same reason that squatting is, if nothing else, more entertaining than renting. <laughs> Rather than settling into a white-walled blank space, squatters daily uncover the stories of their houses and the stories of the people who lived there before them. One such story is, recently, some friends began squatting a house that was abandoned as late as 1997. This house is different from many other squatted houses because the structure is in surprisingly good condition and because the previous residents are likely still alive. 
The attic was noticeably a kid's room, and I was, for all intents and purposes, also a kid in 1997, meaning that, mind-bogglingly, whoever grew up in that house is likely to be roughly the same age I am. They had left behind all kinds of ephemera that I recognized from my own childhood. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles posters, Trapper Keepers, Lisa Frank School Supplies. <laughs> <laughs> we even found a photo of a kid with a stupid 90s haircut on a big wheel in front of that same house in 1993. <laughs> These people were beginning to feel real to me, after all I was touching all their stuff, which of course begged the question of why they ran away from the house in the first place. The dwelling was almost in a state, uh, in the state of the eerily empty domicile of an apocalyptic sci-fi movie where the breakfast table is set and the eggs and toast are still waiting to be consumed, but all the humans have mysteriously evaporated. In the same vein, this family had even forgotten its laundry in the dryer. <laughs> what would possibly prompt these people to make such a slapdash departure from their home of almost two decades? These are the questions never asked and the stories never told at high turnover rental apartments where dweller's curiosity is instead piqued by issues like the cost of the deposits and whether or not the walls can be painted. Uh, it's important to mention here that these stories of previously used and discarded structures continue to be written when the squatters resume caretaking. When you, as a squatter, have carte blanche to renovate a space, it becomes a physical manifestation of who you are. And in every shelf, every paint job, and every decision of carpenter hardwood, you can see yourself reflected. The space becomes yours in ways that transcend money and legal title. The regular, continued, and unique care of a space is the strongest and most valid indication of ownership. Notions like adverse possession and community land trusts are rooted in this stewardship theory and in personal responsibility. Um, and then and then I end up talking a lot about um, stewardship and uh, <laughs> and uh, viewing viewing ownership through the lens of, of stewardship and uh, and properties through the lens of use value rather than market value. Um, yeah. They stay in that place. And what I guess with squatting, do you see like a long term, short term difference as you're researching this? Like, and there are people squatting homes that are or closing in some of those comparisons, that their home, they didn't just go into a home that wasn't going to stay in their home or squat. You know, what numbers are you seeing there? Um, as far as um, people people squatting their own for Yeah, like remaining, because it's like, I know my cousin's living in a house for two years now in Florida that's technically foreclosed, but you, they're staying there. So is that, are they considered squatters? Um, I mean, who's counting? Like, <laughs> I mean, I guess like they would call it squatter. I mean, like economists created this ridiculous term called squatter's rent, which squatter's rent is the amount of money that you would be paying your mortgage with, but that you've stopped paying your mortgage. And so they frame it in this way as though people are getting rich from this like squatter's rent, you know? Like you live there for free and therefore you accumulate all this money that you would have spent on your mortgage, but now you're not. But that's outrageous, of course, because you're not you, you're not spending that money because you don't have it. Because you have to put it toward things like food or medical or uh, you know other other living costs, like the gas and electric and the, the cable and stuff. Right, the cable. Yeah. HBO is doing that. <laughs> well, um, I mean, if you want, I can read. I have, um, I can read one more section about actually uh, something that doesn't get talked about with foreclosures a whole lot, which is um, their effect on renters, because there's actually a pretty high percentage of foreclosure victims that are renters um, and not homeowners, and that that number nationally is about forty percent. Um, so, I mean, what happens to? Uh, what happens to a foreclosure victim when they're renting, or I should say, what happens to a renter when the house they're living in gets foreclosed on? Well, of course, the rules vary state by state, but for the most part, renters don't have any rights, for, for the most part, um, when it comes to foreclosure. And in about half the states in the country, they, they're not 
even required to be notified that the house is being foreclosed on. Mm -hmm. um, usually they have a month to get out. Um, some places it could be 60 days. Um, I think I think Massachusetts and DC allow you to stay for the term of your lease, uh, but that's really rare. I mean, some places are even as short as like 15 days. Oh my God. Yeah. So, uh, I've heard three days. What's that? I've heard the shortest three days. Three days? Where is that? I don't know, right here. Is that true? In New York, they actually just passed the law, so it's um, if your lease is expired, you have 90 days, or, or you're honoring the lease. Okay. So that was just as of a year ago. Okay. And you have to give a notice to tenants now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think there's more awareness going on now about tenants' rights as far as uh, foreclosures go, but. Um, but historically speaking, I mean, there hasn't really been a lot of information about it. But I was thinking maybe I could read to you one more section about um, a renter's uh, resistance to a foreclosure proceeding. Um, and then we could open it up to Q&A. Does that sound good? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the CD that you have up there, is that the same as the book? No, it's completely different. It's a DVD and it's a documentary about um, three different groups of squatters in the San Francisco East Bay. What's the What's the name of the CD? It's called Shelter, a Squatchumentary. It's a documentary. <laughs> Squatchumentary. Wow. I thought it was very clever at one time. Okay. John, if you're reading along, this, yeah, is page, this is page 131. <laughs> okay, so um, we're going to talk about Don Hughes, who uh, was one such renter at 1120 Center Street in Oakland, California. Uh, when the house underwent foreclosure in September 2007, it was snatched up by the Bank of New York, an out-of-state speculating entity. And Hughes and his roommates found themselves in a leafless housing limbo. Unlike many victims of foreclosure who wind up displaced, Hughes decided to stay. As the leaseholder, he received a letter from the bank requesting that the residents leave within a month. If they could produce a copy of their lease, they would be allowed to stay for an additional month, which they did. They wrote in the letter, we're not in the business of being landlords, Hughes summarized. We don't want money from you. It's our policy not to do any work of a landlord. We only care about speculation. Uh, Hughes refused to leave, citing Oakland's just cause for eviction ordinance, which states that owners must have a valid reason for evicting a tenant. Valid reasons can include non-payment of rent, subletting, selling drugs, damaging the property, trash accumulation, or implementation of the Ellis Act, which is a California thing. Um, which is when a property is taken off the market in order for the owner to live in it. But just cause holds that a tenant cannot be evicted arbitrarily. Bank of New York's attorney, Ronald Roop, infamous in the area for ejecting people from their homes, filed an eviction lawsuit. Roop's written argument was that the tenants were living there without permission. But as Hughes pointed out in an answer filing at the city, city clerk's office, that's not actually a reason to evict someone. Consequently, the case was dismissed. In March 2008, so that's almost uh, that's six months later, Bank of New York reemerged with a new offer. They said that they would play landlord if the tenants paid the $12,000 that they owed in back rent. <laughs> they were banking on the fact that we didn't have $12,000, Hughes said, which was accurate. <laughs> Hughes filed another claim at the city clerk's office, this one stating that they were on rent strike until the landlord fixed a host of problems with the house. Mm. Problems included broken pipes, sewage leaks, a broken gate, mold in the carpet, a broken toilet, and non-secure windows. According to Hughes, the conditions were so bad that, quote, the city had declared us a health hazard. Bank of New York sent an inspector to the house to verify the claims but he gave no notice and no one was home when he arrived. 
A few days later, a man arrived at the door and introduced himself as realtor Mason Yanowitz. He claimed that he was there to list the problems with the house and to make an assessment for the bank. Hughes still refused to let him in. It wasn't an issue of trying to evict someone, Yanowitz argued. I couldn't even get inside to do the assessment of things that needed to be fixed. I don't have a magic wand. I can't fix things from the sidewalk. Hughes told Yanowitz that he wasn't allowed on the property and that he wouldn't talk to him until his lawyer was present. But Yanowitz darted into the backyard with a camera anyway, declaring that he had an appointment with the owner, which gave him permission to be on the property. Uh, Hughes chased after him, attempting to block all photographs of the yard. He tried sticking the camera between his legs, thinking that I wouldn't go near his crotch. <laughs> when I got close, he shouted, you stink. So I said, I'll rub my armpits all over you if you don't go away. <laughs> According to Hughes, uh, a farce ensued in which Yanowitz jumped about the yard as Hughes nimbly blocked his camera. Oh. They pushed each other some and climbed around the picnic table. In the end, Hughes' fingers wound up in every one of Yanowitz's photos. This is not 2005 when people were making offers without seeing inside, Yanowitz said. Now there's so many properties to choose from that it's not that way anymore. But the market dropping as fast as it has been it's in the bank's interest to sell it fast with the tenants still in there. I need to clean up. I need to clean the place up and get it sold, but I can't get inside. Eventually, the frustrated realtor left. Feeling violated, Hughes promptly fashioned a no trespassing sign with permanent marker on a piece of corrugated cardboard and wedged it on top of the fence. He also jammed a log behind the gate in lieu of a functioning lock. Months went by. The next time that Hughes heard from Bank of New York was the following November when he received another form demanding the names of the people living at 1120 Center Street and also a copy of the lease. Hughes replied that Bank of New York did not need to know who was living there and that they had already sent a copy of the lease. Bank of New York lawyers had, in fact, referred to it in a previous filing. They were just trying to make us sound crazy, Hughes said. They tried to claim that we never sent the lease and that we wouldn't let inspectors in. Luckily, Hughes was able to contact the Eviction Defense Center in downtown Oakland. <coughs> the center is a nonprofit law corporation that specifically helps low-income Bay Area tenants fight eviction. According to Executive Director Ann O'Mara, Hughes's case was not unique. A lot of times, a landlord gets foreclosed on and leaves tenants behind, she said. Toward the beginning of the foreclosure crisis, lender Fannie Mae agreed to let some renters stay in their homes with a new month-to-month -month lease until the property was resold. This quickly proved unsustainable since lenders, as Hughes pointed out, are not in the business of property management, meaning that they do not have the desire nor the capacity to act as landlords. Here, Don Hughes might remind us that when title is, un when, that when title is unclear and so is the law, everything is negotiable. So, okay, I don't think I'm going to read anymore, uh, but... Let's open it up for um, questions and also um, comments, because I'm sure that a lot of you also have um, relevant experiences to, to add to the discussion. With Babylon system defiance against these kings of money and finance. No reliance, rebel alliance. I ain't down with the bullshit, so I can't spit nonsense. No ride the fence, I'm incensed. The problem's immense, feel the suspense. No false pretense, I'm here. Head forward, I condense the offense. Let the battle commence. Onward, upward, in the present tense. Don't be dense, revolution just makes sense. Intense, we're 1% of the 1%. Got us all bent out of shape. What's it gonna take? Self-defense.